I am Stephanie Meyer. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, this should be a lot of fun. And uh, many, many, many years and quarantining together for several weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we just want a quick thank you uh, to Books and somewhere along this chat. So Books and We're just going to dive right in right. Uh, and get started. Stephanie, yes. welcome. This is from Amanda. She would like to know how much input did you have on the Midnight Sun cover art and what did it mean to you? I had a ton of input on the cover art, um, which is great and not necessarily something you should count on when you start <laughs> publishing a book. I've actually been really lucky. Um, most of my covers I've had input on, not all of them. Um, but it's been great because I feel like the, the covers go together well and they, they all have some meaning. Um, so here's this cover, um, it's shiny, but so with this one, uh, we started out with kind of a blank slate and we, and I, I said, Hey, Edward's totally different. So we could go crazy on this and have a different color and everything. There were some crazy, there, there were some, some crazy, crazy ones. Options. And, uh, and then they said, well, well. Let's keep this of a piece. So um, it didn't take us too long to get to the pomegranate. Um, I know I've been answering questions, people wanting to know why pomegranate. And if you've read Midnight Sun, you know that Edward has kind of a fixation with the Hades Persephone myth and thinks of himself as kind of drawing Bella into his underworld and trapping her there. Um, so the pomegranate seemed like a really good symbol of sort of his mood. Um, but I had, I wanted originally, um, I wanted, we, you know, with Bella's cover, we have the two pretty hands and the apple and it's very sweet. Um, I wanted a hand crushing a pomegranate. And we took a lot of pictures of that. And even with the best ones, it just, it just didn't get it done. It like from a distance, you couldn't tell what it was. It was a messy image. So, and then we had a bunch of really beautiful pomegranates, perfect and round and very pretty, but also very cold and without a lot of um, just didn't seem to mean anything. Uh, and so as we were kind of going back and forth, not knowing what we were going to do, um, our photographer was playing around and he sent this one. Wow, it's getting a lot of shine. It's hard to see. The bookstagram um, is really talking about how shiny it is. It's hard yeah, to photograph. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, so he twi played with the image and like warped it into the shape of a heart. Just subtly, it's not like a really obvious um, thing, but you can see the chambers and everything. And at first I looked at it, that. And then I looked at it again, I'm like, huh. And then we kept going back to it again and again. And it was, it was the, for everybody, it just became the one that had the feeling. So it was a fun experience. I mean, it was a COVID experience. I did this all watching on my computer and everybody else was watching on the computers and we were typing in feedback and I was making my son hold apples and different. Yeah. <laughs> I had all these, I have all these pictures on my phone of him holding <laughs> different fruits saying, try this position, try this position. Um, but we got it done and it turned out really great. Um, uh, a couple of you had similar questions, so I kind of grouped some of them together. Erica and Francesca were curious why you decided to finally release the book now. I released the book like the second it was done. <laughs> um, I, I've True. gotten that question and people have asked like, oh, why did you decide now? I didn't. I just, as soon as it was done, I got, before it was done, it, at the moment when I started to see the light at the end of the tunnel, because I've been working on this for a million years and, um, and sometimes it seemed like there was no way I was ever going to finish it. And I'd be plugging along and I'd do some pages here and some pages there and I'd get a chapter done and think, oh, and then I'd look at how much there was left to do and think, no, it's never going to happen. <laughs> so um, this last fall, uh, probably in September, I n talked to my publisher and said, I think this is going to happen. I think I can get it done by the end of the year. Um, so let's get started. <laughs> and I did. I got it finished in November of 2019. And if you know anything about publishing schedules, you can see how tight that is. Um, originally, it was going to come out end of April was what we were gunning for, although it was very tight. We had you know, several rounds of editing and copy editing and proofreading, and even still typos escaped us that people have found reading it 
um, and they will be fixed in the next in the next printing. <laughs> but um, yeah, we were we went really really fast um, to get it out. So it wasn't like when would be the perfect time to release a book? Oh, I know, it just twenty twenty <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic. No one chose um, twenty twenty. No, it was just you guys have been waiting forever. So as soon as I thought I can do this, then we got to work. Um, and what do you? Mackenzie wants to know what it's like to feel what it feels like to be back in the world again. Um, well, I didn't really leave it. There have been a couple times where I've been away for months, maybe a year, but I've always been back in it. I have little post-it notes by my bed, and I still think there are some on the end on the little side table that are still Edward would think this and just stuck on there. <laughs> and so I, the things were always coming to me. Um, it's nice to be in it immersively sometimes, but I'm always kind of there. So <laughs> I didn't feel like coming back as much as just, this is where I live. Um, Laura would like to know how, um, how are you able to, most of you know that there was a leak way back in the day. Um, how are you able to move past that and get back into writing? You know, it was it was just like a time thing. At first, it was so scary because I had no idea what had happened. And so I'm thinking, has my computer been hacked? Has, have people seen everything I have and all the little pieces I've written and different stories? Is all of that just, do you guys have to wait for it to happen? And around the same time, um, one morning I, le I was at the gym. I left my purse in the car like an idiot. I put it under the seat. <laughs> Somebody must have been watching me. I come back out with my toddlers in tow and the th window smashed in and my purse is gone. And I you know, spent the, the day like trying to stop all the credit cards and I had to go sit forever at the DMV to get a new license. And the other picture was better. That's the part that really burns. <laughs> but um, it was a real strange, similar feeling where every time I would park my car and come back to it, I had this like weird fear. And I was never in danger. It was some little thing. Someone broke a window and took my purse. It was no big deal. But just that feeling of vulnerability, mm -hmm. like you don't know what's happening and you feel like you're in danger, even though you know that's not true. It was really similar with the leak. Like, where did this, how did this happen? Where, where am I in danger? And then after time had passed, it was like, okay, my computer's safe. That was the big thing. Um, and I, I kind of realized what had probably happened and that made me a lot calmer. Um, it was hard having it online because this was such a rough draft <laughs> and there were so many flaws in it and there were just so many things that were going to be done. Um, so at the time I was kind of like emotional. It was also rough because it had been the spotlight for a while at that point and there was so much going on and it, I needed some, some introvert time and I wasn't getting it. So I was kind of on edge and, and pretty frayed back then. So it felt like this huge thing. And then, you know, time passes. Like, like most okay. things. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't it, just like the purse that got stolen. I never think about it anymore. Yeah. You know, it just wasn't that big of a deal. But at the time, it felt huge. Um, and so I was back, like I said, with post-it notes for a while and writing things down. And I'd be like, okay, I don't want to forget this idea. So I'll go sit down and type it out. And that just kind of morphed into longer sections. And I'd be away from it for a while. And then I'd come back again. So it didn't really impact the the time that it took to write the book. I mean, it was a blip compared to just the general obnoxiousness of trying to get this out. <laughs> um, yeah. This is sort of similar. Lori and Angela also had similar questions. When did you actually finish Midnight Sun? I you sort of I touched just on that. this. Yeah. Um, uh, it did not sit unfinished for a while, as we have just yeah, learned. Yeah, it was it, always being, yep. always in progress. Just a really hard book to write. Yeah. Um, in Midnight Sun, you we get to see more of Edward's relationship with his vampire family, which is awesome. What was your favorite relationship to write? Okay, so I've noticed. Oh, in that's the, from sorry, Jenna. Jenna. Jenna's okay, question. Jenna. I've noticed that uh, the word favorite gets bandied around a lot in these questions. <laughs> And that's just not something I can choose for a lot of them. So for this one, there were, you know, there are many relationships. And of course, seeing how he and Alice kind of work, getting to see her visions through his perspective was super cool to do. But then I also, you know, love him relaxing with Emmett. And I love his moments with Esme where, you know, you really get the feeling of the, the mother, son, you know, all of them. I, I guess the one that isn't great is him and Rosalie, but then you get so much information. 
Um, I do, but I also feel like I've said this a couple of times. So if anyone's heard it, I'm sorry, but I feel like it's better. Rosalie's better. See, I, I don't give her. Rosalie as much credit. Um, <laughs> I didn't either. Not until, not well, until Well, you get, you get to see more of what's going on with her for sure. Yeah. But they, you know, they're, they don't have a great relationship and I blame her. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you, we'll get this one out. This. point of view. Some things today with people saying how much and it, they weren't so gripped into it. Like I was thinking about it every second that I wasn't working and I was up at night thinking about what would happen next. And every second I could get at that computer, chin to feed him and like, because I couldn't put it down. Um, with Midnight Sun, I could because I already knew the story. And so there was no sense of what will happen next. I didn't know what was gonna happen next with Twilight. So that was super fun. With, with Midnight Sun, I have a script and I have to follow it exactly. And every action and every word is already planned for me and I don't get to do anything new. And I found that really, really difficult um, and I didn't enjoy it. So that was one that Edward <laughs> and she has like zero anxiety and she's just, a little bit more optimistic and, and fall in love and be happy. And when I'm in Edward's head, I have to suffer. And uh, if you think about New Moon oh. and what Edward's head must have been like then, you can imagine I'm not eager to ever have that experience in my life. Um, so no, I feel like Midnight Sun, it's really, really long. And I think you should have a really good sense of what it feels like to be Edward. Um, I don't recommend reading New Moon next. <laughs> I think you should read Breaking Dawn and remember that he gets to be happy someday. I think I think that's what I had to do when I was done, too. Um, so to give some people a little bit of hope after that, <laughs> um, Alicia and Molly and a bunch of other people um, were wondering if writing Midnight Sun has sparked your interest to write any more in the saga, specifically, you know, Jacob and Renesme, Leah, my personal uh, favorite. Um, any other characters? So the stories are there. Um, there are two more books, I think, in the in the world that I want to write. Um, I've got them outlined in like a chapter written. I think of the first one, and so I know what's I know what's there. Um, I'm not ready to do that right now. I want to do something brand new. Um, for me, a lot of the joy of writing comes from creating and I really want to do like a new world and new rules and new mythology. That's mythology is kind of my thing. So I get excited to create something new instead of just following the old rules I already have. Um, I do want to get to that. Uh, and I plan to eventually, um, sorry that I can't be more like, I mean, I wish I could be more like a machine. Like this is what I want to do next, plug it in, do it. But that's just not well, how that's my brain the creative works. process. Yeah. Know what happens and if I don't ever get around to writing it I will do a bullet points version on my deathbed and she'll probably be the one recording it and I'll just like really that is too much pressure and I'll, I'll tell everything that happens um and uh without the the writing <laughs> <laughs> um another very popular question Teresa would like to know is there any potential for a, a Midnight Sun movie um, I mean, potential. there's always potential, uh, I think, and I don't know how many of you have finished the book. Um, if you have read the book, I think you can start to guess at some of the complications. Um, you'd need such creative sound design because you'd always be hearing other voices all the time um, and, and balancing that. I mean, I think actually they did a cool job with that in the audio book. Um, mm -hmm. where they played with the sound design a little bit. So you kind of knew when you were hearing voices and when you were hearing spoken words. Um, but it would, 
it would be interesting. And then, I don't know, I've always felt like one of the drawbacks of filming the Twilight books is that we've only ever been able to find human actors. Um, and the human <laughs> actors have done a bang up job. They're great. But from what vampires look at like in my head compared to like human beings played in with some special effects, there's, there's a gap. Um, so I've always thought that it would be really interesting to do an animated version, um, particularly when I saw Into the Spider-Verse where they did some amazing creative things. It's like, you know, maybe that's the way. But so there's, it's gonna have to be something that I felt really comfortable that it was gonna be right um, before I get started. So I don't know, it'll be a while if it does happen. Um, another movie type question. Have you heard any songs lately that really make you think, yes, if we were filming any of the movies again, this song would have to be included? Well, that's not really how music and movies work. Um, I don't get to pick the songs. <laughs> We'd have, I mean, I love the soundtrack. Not as the author. Not as the author, no. <laughs> Directors pick the songs. Um, so on the other movies, I, I love the music, but most of it was something I was introduced to through the movies. It wasn't something that I said, oh, this song belongs here, because I don't get to say that. Um, so if you're looking for like the, the music that moves to the beat of the story the way I do, then that's what the playlists are for. Mm -hmm. um, that has the, the stuff I was listening to while I was writing, the stuff that back in 2005 I was starting with. Some of those made the cut at the end because I never found anything that fit it better. But but the, that's where my my soundtrack is. And then sometimes you have a favorite song that they the band won't let you put into their This is true. There is <laughs> I will not name the band, but there is a band who has a beautiful, beautiful song. Mm -hmm. And there have been three different movies that we have tried to put this song into and the band won't let us have it because they don't like it. They don't like the song. They don't like the song. It's a, it's a great song. Um, or there's bands who want $10 million for 15 seconds of their song. Of a song that like came out in 1990 <laughs> that was like, we thought that would be funny to have in there. And then it's like, well, no, we'll use yeah, another funny it. 90s song. Music is always the, the biggest hot button topic, I think. And it's so much more complicated than you realize. Yeah. When you watch a TV show and you just have this perfect song, there is a journey to get there. <laughs> there's a real journey. Um, okay. Uh, Leslie has uh, would like to know what is your biggest challenge that you face uh, when you're writing? Time. Um, <laughs> I feel like life takes up a lot of time, and there are times where I wish I could just, and I do occasionally. When I was finishing Midnight Sun, I went away from all of my family for several weeks and wrote nonstop. Um, didn't really do anything else didn't eat, didn't watch. I didn't have the TV ever on. I didn't leave the house. Um, and uh, I started my schedule got complete. So I was going to bed around three or four in the morning and waking up around noon. And that was my like your kids now, <laughs> like my kids do now with no schedule. Um, so I, you know, I turned everything my nights around, I turned off my email. And sometimes it's a really great thing to do. But you can't do that all the time. And like, for example, right now, for probably the last time in my life, I have all three of my boys under my roof, and they can't go anywhere. <laughs> and I want to spend time with them. Like, I know they're going to go back to college, and they're going to be away from me. And, and so you, you want to live your life too. And so finding those times to actually just really, really write. And I kind of need to have a lot of alone space to do that. Um, it's hard. Um, here's a fun question. What is your favorite line? This is from Kenzie. What is your favorite line from the Twilight Saga? See, there's that word favorite again. Um, <laughs> it favorite. changes all the time. Right now, because the last thing I did was Midnight Sun, um, I'm going to say the part that I think I might be the most proud of is after Edward watches James's video and he has an emotional moment. <laughs> to <laughs> say the least. To say the least. Um, and I think that piece that ends that section is, is my very favorite right now. My favorite is stupid, shiny Volvo owner. You like the funny stuff. I really do um, because it's so much sad. So, so much, sad. so much sad. So I need, I need the happy. Uh, Marika and Brooke had similar questions. Um, and also a lot of you had this question. So I'm going to let you address it. How are Edward and Bella doing now? Do you ever imagine where the Cullens are today? Um, so we got a bunch of questions that were ranged from like, where are they now to 
Um, how are they spending quarantine? How are they? Yeah. How would they spend quarantine to like in November of 2009? What did <laughs> what were Esme and, and Carlisle do for a date on a Friday night? And it's like, OK. Um, future, even though I think starts about four years after Breaking Down. Um, so that's so that's in the past. But for me, it's the future. It's a weird. Um, I don't like just have off the top of my head, you know, what happened at this point? What happened at this point? And it's all I don't, I don't want to have it defined because a few flashbacks and these are all things that didn't exist until I needed them to, you know, and so I keep all that stuff. Um, and, and so it's not like I'm from the story. I, all that I, everything that story is already written. That makes sense. Makes sense to me. Okay. Um, I know because I sometimes ask and I am shut down uh, frequently. At what point in the writing process did you visualize Bella's immunity to powers like mind reading? Um, and was it because she was a shield? And did you think of it right away? Or was her immunity initially just a quirk? Um, yeah, so it was a process that developed. So it started out as a quirk, although I was aware that, you know, I figured she was going to be a vampire probably someday as I was writing. Like that was obviously <laughs> one of the futures open to her besides dying. Um, and so I knew it was going to be something when she was a vampire. I didn't define it as a shield. I hadn't thought through all the implications of how much it was going to be. I just knew that becoming a vampire would make that more important, not less important. Um, it didn't turn into something more until the Volturi existed. Um, and they didn't exist until later, but I think we have a question about that. Should I, or should I hit it now? Cause I'm here. How you about the Volturi, how they, how they exist. Yes. Oh, here, it's right here. Okay. Angelica. Angelica, I knew someone asked We're gonna about jump it. forward. Okay. So Angelica. What made you to develop the Volturi? All right. So originally midnight, uh, new moon had a very lackluster ending because it was just like Alice thinks Bella's dead and calls Edward and he gets the call and then he shows up in Forks and they work things out. Very <laughs> boring. And I gave an early draft to my mom, who was one of my beta readers for everything I've done. And she very nicely for her, like she she can be a little blunt sometimes. And so I expect that from her. And it's a, it's actually a good thing when you're writing to have someone who's blunt with you about things. But so she was careful and she's like, you know, maybe the ending needs some danger. <laughs> maybe there should be something at stake. <laughs> and I'm like, those are good words. <laughs> and so then the Volturi were born as I started thinking about what, what could give us stakes at the end. It's like, well, Edward, what if he didn't come back? Like, what if there, you know, and I had already kind of imagined his despair and, and, but then, you know, how does he end it? He doesn't know there's werewolves, so that takes that out. You know, his family's not going to help him, so he has to find someone else. And I'm like, wait, who's the someone else? And then I started thinking about the world more because it's always just been this little world with the colons are the most powerful thing in the world that we knew of. You know, we had a couple. We had James show up in Victoria and, mm -hmm. you know, some rogues, but they weren't powerful compared to the colons. And so I'm like, oh, someone more powerful really powerful and and that was fun and then i and then that got into like the idea of you know what would make them powerful and, and their collection of talents and finding people who are special um really sort of coalesced the world for me it started making a ton of sense and and then i thought about how bella would fit into that and what she could become more specifically so those things are linked you know the Volturi gave rise to bella superhero when I'm going rogue, when you <laughs> when you came up with the idea for the Volturi, did you sit down and write out history for the Volturi, or did you did it just kind of come in? I did a lot of research, so I was looking up, 
you know, trying to find historical period that I wanted. And it got me thinking about the world and like who was in charge before them and how did that work and the dynasties. And so I have a lot of um, sketchy notes. Right. I, uh, I draw things when I'm first coming up with ideas. So actually physical sketches were part of it. And then as I was trying to find their history, um, I had picked the name Volturi, just had been what I was working with. And I got online and, you know, oh, right. and I found Volterra that actually existed. And I'd already learned this lesson about not picking places that really exist. Like I knew better, but it just was there. Was and and I pulled up the pictures and it was the place. And I started to think, is it all real? It has that clock tower. It does. Um, okay. Uh, I wanted to start with this question because it's my favorite book, but I thought I'd wait. Uh, Trish and Emily and a bunch of other people they all love the Twilight series, but they would really, really like to know if uh, what's up with the host, you know? There's not anything up with the host right now. And it pains me to say it because I, you know, some books you want to sit down and write and some books you want to be done. Um, and the host is, the sequel to the host is one of those things that I just know everything that's going to happen. I have it super outlined. I got into too much detail. Like I, I planned every aspect of it before I sat down to write it. And now there's nothing to create. And so we're kind of back to the same place where it's just, I did too much figuring out, too much figuring out, too much base work. And so I need to get in there and do it, but it's not as exciting because there's not a lot to create. It's just going to be plugging in the words and I don't work as well that way. So this is another one that's on the list and another one that I'll have to do for my deathbed if I can't get it done. Well, speaking of, I'm going to need something more than your deathbed on that one. Um, <laughs> speaking of other things you're working on, Justin and Katarina had a, some similar questions. Are you still planning on eventually releasing that fantasy novel with the map included that you referred to in your interview with Oprah? That's a, that's a throwback. Um, <laughs> like your, <laughs> <Old school. laughs> uh, like maybe your story about the vicious mermaids. Okay. So right now in my new computer, I have, I would guess about 23 partial novels. Some of them are just a quick outline. So I wouldn't forget the idea. Some of them have chapters. Some of them have whole Pinterest boards dedicated to them. Um, and many of them are map in the front piece <laughs> fantasy novels. And so that may be the next thing I do. The mermaid one is in there and that's one I, I really want to do, but it's huge. It's a big book and that's really intimidating. Um, so I'm thinking some of the others that are a little bit less, I've, I've lived with that one for a long time. And the longer I live with something, the less exciting it is. It's just a really sad fact. Um, and so I'll probably do something next that has a map there's one that doesn't that's also exciting right now. So I'm not sure. He does, she doesn't, she knows everything. Map. And she doesn't want me to, she has two map books that she wants. I like that we call them map, map books. books. <laughs> two map in the front piece fantasies. And she is torn down the middle on which one she wants more. It varies from day to day. Well, because one is just like a couple of weeks ago, she called and said, you know, I was driving the other day and I was, and initially I was like, stop. There's only one that you need focus to focus on what on. you're supposed to do. That is why I wanted Midnight Sun done so she could do this other one. But now I don't know. Yeah. Now I'm torn. She's easy to sway. <laughs> it's true. Um, okay. Jennifer would like to know, uh, would you consider co-authoring a book with another writer like some of our favorites, Shannon Hale, Rainbow Rowell, Jenny Lawson, who has a bookstore, the Knower Bookshop, that people should We will visit out. someday yeah. when we can. It's on my list. Yep. Um, I have thought about that. And some of it is like super appealing. The idea of having someone else to work with and and collaborate with, because I've I spent time, um, like Rainbow and I did a, uh, a retreat once and we just, you know, we're working on our own things, but talking about it with someone who gets the process was really helpful. And so it, it sounds like a good idea, but then I know myself. And I've learned from making the movies where we have someone else writing the script and someone else putting words in my character's mouths that I sometimes am difficult. Um, <laughs> and I'm not usually difficult to anybody's face. Like I'm difficult on the inside and I think things. I don't do something different with a character that, that I love, that I was writing. I, I don't know if I could do it. So I haven't ever tried. Maybe it'd be.
crazy. I think it takes a, I think you have to, everyone has a different fake people actually exist. Yeah, and take that very seriously. Folks from those people, and so you want to keep that. That graphic novel of I don't want to die for it, but I live would. for it. Of the stuff that wasn't in featured in Twilight were my favorite things to write because um, <laughs> when I could get. So I could create them so much more exciting. And I think the most exciting part was the car chase in Phoenix, where Bella knows this happens, but there's so much she doesn't know about it. And it also was like it's there was a physical sensation to writing that because it's like you feel the time. And I was listening to music that was you know, going. And, um, and so I was just in that place where it was like, and this was something I was writing when I was by myself and in, in the middle of the night. Um, and so I was just really in and no interruptions and because I go downtown sometimes. And, and so every time I'm on that road, I think, okay, this is where this happens. And this is where this happens. And this is where the mirror breaks off. And this is, you know, and, and it's great. And we did it. We broke the speed limit a little bit, but not a lot. It's not as much as Edward. And uh, but just watching him shift through it and like imagining it, it was pretty cool. Um, okay, Twyla and Sh I'm. I hope it's Chandra, maybe Chandra. Um, have some similar type questions, so bear with me. Twyla specifically would like to know: Have you considered doing a book about Freaky Fred's life after he disappeared? Chandra, um, similarly was wondering if more Volturi are coming back. So I'm not going to answer those very specifically because spoilers. However, I do plan to see Fred again. Um, he got to stay alive for a reason. Um, he wouldn't be in the next novel. He would be in the one after that. Um, but yeah, I, I I know his where he goes from that point on. Um, and then the Volturi obviously have to be dealt with. You yeah. know, they are the big, the big bad. They clearly are not going to leave the Collins alone. <laughs> um, so that is uh, that that they have to be dealt with, and and they're not going to do this like, hey, let's you meet us here and we'll fight it out. You know, they're going to come at them from the side. So that is coming. Yikes. Uh, Brittany would like to know between Twilight, Midnight Sun, or Life and Death, do you have a favorite version? A favorites. Again, with the favorites. Sorry. However, I would say kind of Life and Death because um, it just kind of broke away from all of the expectations of like what you see in your head. And I got to see new things in my head. And I love Edith so oh, much. And Archie. I love Archie. I really love Archie. I'm going to tie this into the next question. Um, what book of yours would you like to make into a movie next? <laughs> well, I mean, the one that is primed and ready to go is The Chemist. Um, yeah. We were going to do that as a TV show, but like a limited run, you know, eight episodes. I think we had eight to 10. We <laughs> planned out eight, we planned out 10. I wrote the script for the pilot and I like it a lot. Like I'm ready to, to make that happen. So that one would be fairly easy to fall back into, but I would like to see Life, Life and Death. That would be trippy, right? Oh. And fun to cast. Just Archie. love Archie. Yeah. <laughs> love him. Um, Madison and Louise had some similar questions. Uh, they are aspiring novelists and was wondering what the process was like um, in terms of getting your getting a book published. I mean, I'm thinking it probably has changed quite a bit because <laughs> I'm old now. Like, you know, I was talking about writing Twilight with a baby in my arm. That baby graduated from high school this year. So um, it's been a while and everything's changed. I imagine a lot more is done online. Um, when I was starting, uh, so I finished my book, always a great place to start. <laughs> I think that like worrying about publishing when you have five chapters done is worrying you don't need to do that's distracting you. 
write your book, love your book, get a reader or two, make sure they help you out. Hopefully they're like my mom and they'll just be like, maybe some danger. Very and they much. give you useful things to do. Make those changes, listen, but also listen to yourself. And when you feel like this is just not what my characters would do, listen to that, get it where you want it. Um, then go online and do some research because when I was doing this, you sent physical letters out to agents. You sent one page that was called a query that just said, this is my name. Here's a paragraph about my book. I've never written anything before. You don't know who I am and I'm totally unimportant. So please just ignore this. <laughs> um, and then my agent told me after, after, uh, so her assistant pretending to be her <laughs> asked for a copy of the book. Um, and I sent it to her. And then my actual agent contacted me and said, hey, we want to represent you, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. I still, I remember that morning and it doesn't seem real even now. <laughs> um, but she told me later that always send the book with the query. And it said online very specifically not to do that. So I'm a rule follower and I did what I was told and it worked out. Um, but I imagine now everything's online. Back then they said, don't send emails. They're too hard to hit delete on. Send a physical envelope. Um, they're pretty well laid out online. If you yeah. find find the person who, or the company who you, who you feel like would represent your book the best and just read up on them. Well, and a good way to find that is if you think my book is like Twilight or my book is Check like this, look at who their agent is, yeah. pick that way. And then don't worry about the publisher because that's what your agent will do. Agents yeah. are wonderful. They're great. Don't skip that step. Agents <laughs> are important. Um, this is another favorite question, so I won't put you through that. Which perspective did you enjoy writing uh, the most? Bella, Edward, or Jacobs? That's from Taylor. Uh, right. Taylor Lautner? <laughs> Taylor. Yeah. So um, like I said before, Edward was painful. And Jacob, I think if I were writing Twilight from his perspective, which would probably be a pretty boring book because he just mostly is down in the push, not doing much. Um, New Moon would be more interesting. Uh, he's pretty happy-go-lucky at that point in time. And so he shouldn't be that hard. But so I have to say Bella, because when I did write Jacob, it was at the worst point in his life, which is what I tend to do, I guess. And so he's really <laughs> unhappy then. Oh, you do sort of. Yeah, the host, right? The chemist. It's Everyone's a lot. Of, well, suffering. you have to write characters that are in chaos or else there's yeah. nothing to write. But so Bella's the happiest one. And so I, I like writing her because then I get to be happy. Um, um, and he just gets a hum of what he's thinking. Would Charlie then also have a gift if we, if he became a vampire? And if so, Maybe points it would if you haven't read everything. Um, so yes, Charlie Turi loved having um, Eleazar because he could kind of feel things out. And if there was a human that was unusual, he'd be like, oh, there's something with that kid. And they could just turn him. And then if it wasn't important, you know, kill him. No big sludge. Um, yeah. Well, not if they've turned him. Then oh, they just have yeah. to, right. you know, just garbage. But um so there, anybody could have a gift um, and there might be something unusual about the way you think that makes you different from other people that would turn into something kind of cool if you were a vampire. But so no, nobody's destined to be a vampire. They just found a way there. Um, this question is from Cherish. Cherish, for those of you who do not know, uh, I believe her last name is Danae. She wrote a song for Midnight Sun called Silence. It is so beautiful. You can so gorgeous. I don't have all of her stuff on my paper, but if you go to Stephanie's website and you scroll down through some of the updates, there's a place, lots of places where you can download it. She really got Midnight Sun before it was out. Like she got that perspective. Yeah. And it's, and I mean, and it's not just that she understood the story. What a talent. Her voice, her songwriting, amazing. Beautiful. So if you're watching Cherish, thank yeah. you. Good job. Um, her question is uh, Were there any other baby names, boy or girl, for Renesme? <laughs> <laughs> um, so and as, more than one person asked this question, well, so it's included. And, you know, outside of the fandom, I get a lot of grief for a lot of things, you know, cause I do nothing right. Um, from some perspectives, um, but inside the fandom, nothing have I got more grief on than <laughs> Renesmee. Um, if it had been a boy, the name that Bella had chosen was Edward Jacob, um, which is, you know, a fine name. 
but not very exciting. Um, Renesme, I think, is a great name. And yeah, it's a made up name. But most names are like, where did Stephanie come from? Where did from Megan Stephen, come from? But Nowhere. Stevie, you know, we made up all the names. And if you listen to the sound of the name, like there are names that we have retired. Um, we don't do a lot of Mildreds anymore because it's this hard sound. There are nasally sounds. All of the sounds in Renesme are really pretty. There are lots of three syllable names. Um, and it suits her because she there is no one like her. Um, so I don't hate it, but I know other people don't love it. There were there was never another name for her though. That was always her name. Um, this is a quick question um, from Regina. How old was Heidi from the Volturi and when was she changed? And did she have a mate? We have a show and tell. Oh yeah, oh we do. Okay. You're not gonna answer the question because you can find because it. Yes, I answered the question. In the Twilight Saga official illustrated guide, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, really great, I got to write a lot of backstories. And I said before, like things are kind of out there undefined. And so for this, I got in and defined some things that I knew would play in, but that made sense for people's backstories. And so Heidi, I think she has a page, but she also, her story is told better in Victoria's section. Um, so that's where you should go. That's where you should go. Um, and sort of similarly, I'm jumping around a little bit. A couple of people were wondering if they would ever find out about Alice's backstory. Also, not only is it in the guide, but there is a movie version. There's a short um, couple of years. I say a couple of years ago, but it was <laughs> a long time ago. Longer than that. Um, Stephanie and Lionsgate, Women in Film, Volvo, Tongle, a bunch of people came together and made this thing called, I have to write it down because it was a long title, Storytellers, New Voices of the Twilight Saga. There was a big contest. Um, and people made really cool movies and yep. cool scripts. And the one that won were the Spear sisters, uh, Kaylee and Sam, and they did uh, a short. About Alice. Yeah, called and the Mary how Alice she got where she, where she was. So it's great. Go it's look great. it up on YouTube. It's on YouTube. I think they have it on their site. They have it. It's, you can find it. Google it. <laughs> Get it. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, what are you reading right now? Melissa would like to know. Um, Melissa, I am just into um, Justina Ireland's uh, sequel, Deathless Divide. She did um, Dread Nation, which I thought was a really great zombie book. That not not just because it's a good zombie book, but it's a really good look at how our country runs and how it would have been if there was a zombie attack before the war. Um, there's just a lot of elements that you read and go, yeah, that's what would have happened. And then the characters are always, are really fun. It's really well written. So that is that is my my treat right now when I have free time. Because I'm too anxious all the time. So I've just been into comfort reads. What are your comfort reads? So my biggest comfort read is Rainbow Rowell's Attachments. Um, and uh, she left, and, and Fangirl, I, that one sometimes, but I just read Attachments when I'm sad and it makes me feel better. And I was thinking about this the other day because someone asked me that question um, in an interview. And just looking at myself on paper, I would think that what I would need would be like dragons and worlds apart and like total fantasy. But man, it's just Lincoln. <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know, Lincoln and Beth. And that's where my happy place is. So um, some, this is a very specific question from Norma. She wants to know what role volleyball played in your life. <laughs> <laughs> and did you play in high school? A big oh Norma. Um, <laughs> I am a, a horrible athlete. Um, and I did play volleyball. Um, not in school because I was a big high school where people had to have talent to play on the teams. I played with my church youth group because we all had to, and I didn't have a choice. <laughs> and uh, none of us were great, but I was definitely the worst. And so every time it was like my turn to serve, everybody else was just like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't love volleyball. Um, I played vo played volleyball in high school. <laughs> I rode the bench. Uh, my dad really wanted me to be an athlete. Um, <laughs> would you ever consider releasing Forever Dawn? What oh, Sandy would like to know, or would you consider letting her borrow it? Um. Oh, I'm not sure. I still have it. Oh Lord. 
I mean, seriously, there's I, been a lot of computer. There have been crashes. a lot. And so I have an old computer and I've got some thumb drives. I'd really have to look. I don't know where it is. I did copyright it though, because all I have to do is just mail well, it, it in. Somewhere. So it's at the Library of Congress. <laughs> Um, I would not ever publish it because A, it wasn't great, and B, I rewrote the story so it doesn't exist. But like sometime if you guys if you want to get together, um, we could just sit, sit down and back here on yeah, this couch. You'd have to like not leave the room and just keep it there, but maybe we can figure it out after I find it. I've never I have never read it. No, nope. and she's seen everything, so that's how buried that is. Um do you have, who, who uh, this is from Christina and Jody with an I, and if this is my agent, <laughs> if this is Jody so Reamer, you know you're not allowed to do this. She's in here somewhere. Um, uh, favorite scene from the books that didn't make it into the movie. Okay. All right. Um, Jody, who's probably not my agent. Um, <laughs> and Christina. And Christina. Uh, so I miss the blood typing scene a lot. Yeah, man. That one, I, I liked it. It was romantic in such a weird way. <laughs> um, what are some other ones that that one's probably the big one? I mean, I miss the extended meadow where they actually talk about everything. Mm -hmm. um, we got, we, you know, movies are short. You can't put everything in. And so we got just like a few lines in the meadow and there were like, we didn't get to see his little like panic attack that yeah. I liked. And um, so, so that would have been nice. That's why if, <sighs> Big if it were to ever have if a movie version ever comes out again, it like it won't be want, a movie. It won't be a movie. It'll yeah. be TV because that's the only place Pride where you can do the full length. BBC, BBC Pride and Prejudice, hour, perfect adaptation, yeah. right? Nothing, exactly. Yes. Um, let's see. So many favorites. We'll just ask them and then I'll tell them why they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I have a note here that this is from Kelly. Who is your favorite care? The favorite character you've created in all of your books? And legit, I wrote, "How dare you ask?" Kelly. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you might as well come to my house and say which one of the children you birthed <laughs> is your favorite, because it doesn't. You don't have favorites. You can't have favorites. I mean, even the villains are kind of important, right? You know, and you care about them. And so you you can't you can't pick favorite characters. It's me. They, they'll know. They're in my head. They'll know. <laughs> um, is there a chance, this is from Nadia, uh, is there a chance we'll get to read more from Bo and Ida? No, I mean, I do love them. I love them dearly, but uh, I don't want to write more books that are kind of what's been written. Now, it'd be different, right? Because you don't get Renesme. So that would keep the Volturi from getting involved as quickly. But you know they're coming back anyway, because once Edward went there and they saw what was going on in Forks, they were going to come. So it would get to that place eventually. Um, and I don't want to rewrite anything anymore. I just want to write new stuff. Um, Rebecca has a very detailed question about, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing for you. But she's had a, a very years long friendly rivalry with her friends needing needing they need to know <laughs> which high school in Arizona Bella went to. Was it Horizon, Kellen Lutz's alma mater? Really? Yep. Or Chaparral, your alma mater. Given where I placed her house. Um, she also she, mentions that in here. She is a Horizon student, as was my husband. Um, my husband and I went to rival high schools. Uh, and uh, all we all know, Chaparral is the better school, <laughs> but Bella went to Horizon. Rebecca, I so it didn't that. bother her education that much that she ended up at Forks at a little school because I mean she was only at Horizon anyway. Right. Uh, I hope that solves your friend. I hope you were on the Horizon side and that yeah. you won. Um, I think we're nearing the end here. Do you have any upcoming projects outside of books that you are excited about? And so in addition to this, what's it like being a producer now? Stressful. Being a producer during a pandemic is stressful and boring because you can't do anything. Um, and there's things that I do want to do. We're, we've been working for a while on. Would love to see. It's going to be a television show someday. Um, and it's. We're going to get there. We're getting there. It's it's frustrating right now. You know, we can't do much, but we'll get there. Um, I also would really love to do uh, Midnight in Austin Land because Austin Land is the best movie experience I've ever had because it's a comedy. And we had all these funny people and we were laughing our butts off all no day long. There were no special effects. And there were no special well, there effects. There are a few little ones. Yeah. But it was great. Um, and Midnight in Austin Land's always been my favorite 
of the novels. Um, which would be great. So those are some things we'd like to do, but and so um takes us back to a place in time where we fell in love with Twilight and allows us to reflect on all of our life changes. It's a strange life. Um but then like with the books at least it's nice because I look back over this time and like and I wrote, I've written more than a million words, like published words. And that it, I don't know, feels like an accomplishment, you know, that's exciting. And, yeah. and getting this one finally out is exciting to just be, to, you know, it's been sitting there undone for so long and that just nags at the back of your head. And so it's great to have. Uh, really quickly because <laughs> it was seriously a one day experience you know i loved reading my whole life books were my thing i was the one kid out of six that never didn't have a book open in her hands and and uh, at school i was such a nerd and i that was my escape you know i didn't who cared what was happening in the real world because the fake world is where it's at um, and so I knew that I loved books. I knew that books were everything. Um, and then I had the dream that I've talked about a lot, a lot and, and I had my memory issues, which are still a problem. And I went to write it down. And the experience of taking this dream and making it concrete and real was like nothing I'd ever experienced. You know, it's like write, reading a book on crack in a good way, don't do drugs. Um, but like it just, everything was turned up. It was so much more than reading to create it. And so that one day I was completely hooked. Like it was a done deal. And if I'd never gotten published, I would still write stories because it feels like nothing else. Um, what advice, this is from Shauna uh, and Michelle. They had similar questions. What advice would you give high school students who love to write or just, I would expand that out to say anyone who loves to write, so your next generation of writers, um, what kind of advice would you give them about? Well, I kind on their of project? said this before, but you know, just write, just write and write and write, and don't read. let anybody stop you. Read because mm -hmm. that's a great way to see how things are done and get an idea of how you want to express yourself. But just write it down and don't worry about it, readers. Don't worry about what the point is. Just write for the experience. Um. I think we have at least touched on most of the topics nice. and we are nearing our end time here. So we have one last question. We have a few shout outs. Um, it is. Oh, happy birthday, Chloe. Chloe's birthday. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on your birthday. That's happy really birthday. nice. Also, uh, you got a little note from a friend from high school. Her name is Stephanie. Oh, Stephanie Mansky. She was in my <laughs> art class. And yes. I was, I was, I, Megan showed me this. It was like, she, well, she said to me, I, I got one from somebody who knew you in art, but I don't remember her name. She was a junior and you were a senior. I'm like, oh, Stephanie Mansky. Um, I was like, no, I hope that you're right. awesome right now. Um, I can't, I have no idea what you've been doing for the last million years since we've been apart, but hopefully it's been great. And hi. <laughs> Uh, she specifically pointed out the state fair. I would love to know on the DL, you can tell me what happened at the no, state we fair. Just, we were in art class. We exhibited our art at the state fair oh, and, okay. and won some awards and were awesome. Um, okay, last question to wrap up this shindig. Um, lots of similar questions, but specifically Brianna and Jacqueline. Um, what have you loved most about the world of Twilight and the fandom? Um, well, the fandom is kind of, aside from writing the world, which, you know, is like a drug. It's awesome. Um, don't do drugs. I wouldn't know. I don't do drugs. I'm just comparing it to what other people <laughs> says is awesome. But writing is a rush. It's amazing. Um, there you go. A rush. But like that, that, that all these people care about it. It's kind of amazing. And then you care about each other. Like Twilight has been, for some reason, a, a connector. It makes, it, people have found each other. We found each other because of Twilight. Mm -hmm. Um, we have we work with um, some great, amazing ladies who found each other through Twilight, and and not only do people find friendships through it, they last. Like it's been 15 years now, and a lot of these people are have shared their lives over that time. And how amazing is yeah the, that that happens? Yeah, and finding and not just friendships, but like 
just because I've been reading so much of these Ural's questions and everything, it's like um, jobs from yeah. from Twilight and and careers and like life, like moving from another country to America to pursue your love of whatever something inspired from that. So I think, so yeah, just I mean, it's just amazing that something that I wrote to entertain myself could affect people in positive ways. I think that's amazing. And I'm really, really grateful for all of you um, because you've made this into a world that exists in this world and not just in my head. And it's such a positive place. You guys are like the nicest fandom, I think, that exists. You're kind and you're good to each other. And I think that's amazing. And that's the best part. Okay. I'm through my 10 pages. <laughs> That was a lot of questions. We went longer than we were supposed to. So we have a few wrap up things we have to say. I'll let you go first. Um, all right. So again, <laughs> thank you all. Thank you so much for being here today. I, I wish we could see you. Um, I wish you could ask us these questions live. Um, but at least we had this. And thanks to Books, Book, Books A Million because we wouldn't be here without them. Yes. And for doing all the tech because that's stressful. Um, so, uh, Books A Million has a link it's a button it's you right can there, see so. right down here a green one for tonight only and for just you guys on this uh in this event it's a buy two get one free of the other twilight paperback so you can grab those tonight maybe for some friends who haven't read christmas is coming up <laughs> it's chloe's birthday it's chloe's birthday guys <laughs> what did you get her um Okay, that's it. Those, right. are, those are that's my list. Thank you so much. Yeah. You guys have a great evening or night. What's left of it?